All right, guys. Exodus time. Stuck between boredom and endurance. Have you had a chance to think about this, what that could possibly mean, uh, being stuck between these two things? Well, we know what endurance is, right? Endurance is, how would you describe endurance? Persevering, Persevering, right? Like cheering for a football team when you have no reason to do so, right? Like the Bears, right? Is that what, is that what our Packers fans are saying? Yeah, yeah. Preseason, we were saying that about the Packers fans, so it's, it's fair, right? Uh, perseverance, endurance. Endurance is a little bit bigger than perseverance, though. Perseverance is the act of, of making it through things, but endurance is doing that, persevering, with a sense of hope and of mission. Like, you don't lose hope as you're enduring difficult things. You don't lose the sense of mission that you know where you're going and where you're trying to get to as you're persevering through difficult things. Endurance means you're going to take a lot of time to get there, but you're not going to lose sight of the goal. All right. Now, what's boredom? Uh, No, thank you for not specifically coming right out and saying, you sitting in church. (laughs) Thank you. Appreciate that. What is boredom? How do, we, how do we look at boredom? I think there's a couple ways to look at it. Great office clip, right? Uh, all of a sudden, Jim, just his head just hits the desk because he just can't do any more paperwork, and it flashes to Pam, and she says, every, every now and then, Jim just dies of boredom. If you've ever worked in an office, in a cubicle, you might have had that same experience. If you've ever done the same thing over and over again every day, you may have had that experience. If you had a boss who would come to you and say, we need these six reports done, and then comes to you at the end of the day and says, well, now we don't need them anymore, you might think, what am I doing here? And when that happens day by day, week by week, year by year, it starts to become boring. Boring isn't just like not having something interesting to do. Because when I was a kid, boredom was defined as, like, if I ever said that I was bored, what did my parents say? Well, that's your own fault. (laughs) Go and do something, right? You have a bike. You have something. Go. Play in the woods. I don't care. Just just go. Play. Find some friends. Go. Don't be bored. Is that what we say today? Sometimes. Maybe. Not really. It's different. How do we use boredom today? There's been a lot of research that has gone into boredom over the last decade or so, looking into what boredom truly is. How do we really define it? And are there benefits to being bored? And frankly, that's what the research has been coming out and saying, that there are great benefits in being somebody or having times in your life when you are bored because it's at those times when you do not have a phone to scroll through, when you don't have people to talk to, when you are stuck with your own thoughts and your own life and your own ideas, that even though it's difficult, you end up being more creative. You end up seeing the world in a way that is different. You end up understanding who you are in a deeper and greater way simply by being bored. So what does it mean to be stuck between this thing called boredom and this thing called endurance? Well, I think maybe this is the question for us. Today, in this middle time that we are in, I want you to think about what has become boring to you. What has become boring? My kids use boring as something derogatory, right? It's just not new. It's not fresh. It's not something that's, that's, you know, that's just new. It's too old. It's cliche. And for them, it's like, well, it's two weeks old, so it's cliche, right? It's, it's quick. The trend has gone. The trend has moved past that. It's, it's now boring. What has become boring to you? during this time, in the last 18 months? Dare I say, even change has become a little bit boring. Have we gotten so used to changing everything, our entire lives, our outset every two weeks or every month or every quarter, that it's just become passe? It's become boring? Whether there's masks or not, where we can wear them, where we can't, where we shouldn't, what we do. Well, I mean, all this stuff, it's become kind of, we've gotten used to it, haven't we? We've acclimated to a life that is very different than the life that we led two years ago. It's different. We've gotten used to it. It's become boring. All right. 
how do we make this work? How does this actually work in our lives? Well, I told you this whole series is about looking at the journey of the Exodus, the time when the Israelites went from slavery in Egypt into freedom in the promised land and seeing how their entire journey mirrors the journey that we are taking right now. And week four, we're at the point of the story where things have gotten really interesting. Last week, President Buss was here and he shared with us the story of how the Israelites could have gotten into the promised land after only two years. They were at the edge of the promised land after two years, which doesn't seem very much. They got to the edge and they said, well, okay, God has promised, this God who has brought us out of slavery in Egypt has now promised us to give us this land, but there's people already living there. What is going to happen? And so the people kind of step back and they say, whoa, wait a second. Let's go check this out first. Let's dip our toes in the water first before we jump all the way in. And so they take one person from each of the 12 tribes. They send 12 spies into the land to just go and see what's going on, to do some recon, right? So they are checking out where there are people living. They're checking out where they could possibly settle. They're doing all these things. And when the spies come back, they give a report. And the report goes like this. This is going to be too hard. There are already people living everywhere we would want to leave. We're going to have to war with them. And those people have better weapons. They have better uh, food. They are taller and bigger than we are. There is no way that we can win this. That was their report back. Except for two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb. They came back and said, yes, all of that is true. However, we have something that they don't. Our God has promised us that he would bring us out of freedom into a land. What's that land called? The prom- literally, the promised land. I am promising this land to you. And if we are at the edge of this, and if God says he is promising this land to you, is he going to give it to us? Yes. And is it going to be hard? Yes. But he will make it right. So the two voices spoke this truth, and yet they were drowned out. All of the people, the crowd, the mob said, no, 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 this is going to be too hard. We're, you know, this is bad moving around in the wilderness, but we're used to it. We're used to it. We'd rather wait for a more opportune moment. Because of this disobedience, God came to the people and said, look, none of you are going to enter the promised land. All of you who disobey me, none of you will see it. Not one of you. Well, two of you will. Joshua and Caleb, the two who spoke up and said, we will follow the Lord above all else. The rest of you are going to perish in the wilderness, and I'm going to give the next generation another try at this. So that's where we left off last week. And what we didn't mention was, guess what the people did after they heard this. What would you do if you just found out you were being punished? I mean, come on, think about when you were a kid, what did you do when you found out you got grounded by your mom or dad? What did you do if you were smart? You said, I'm sorry. And then you said, well, what can I do to make up for it, right? Can I, can I, can I get out of this punishment somehow? So that's what the people did. They walked back up to the edge of the promise and said, well, God, we're really, really sorry. We, we, we didn't mean it, and uh, we're just going to go in and take this land anyway. And guess what happened to them? They got obliterated. Because they missed the whole point. The point was to trust God as their leader and to follow him into battle, to let him lead, to let him go before them. And even in their saying they were sorry, they decided to push the issue. Moses said, don't do it, don't do it. And they said, no, 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 we're going to go do it. People, right? People. So they got turned away from the promised land. Now instead they have to wander back in the desert and the peninsula for 38 more years. Their wandering is aimless. It has no goal. And it is a punishment for not trusting in the Lord. And what happens over that 38 years? What do they get to eat? Same stuff they had before, which was 
Manna, which means, remember what that word means? What is it? Yeah, we don't know. What did it taste like? I don't know. What was it? I don't know. It literally means, what is it? Same food every day, every meal. What did they have to drink? Well, in the desert, is there a lot of water? No, but when the people got thirsty, they were able to ask Moses, and God would give them water. How often do you take for granted that you can literally go to a tap at any place that you go to, turn it, and there is water? You don't ever have to get thirsty if you don't want to. They had to get thirsty before they could drink. Everything was the same, and none of it was comfortable. All right, have any of you ever done anything for 38 years? Who's been married for 38 years or more? We got a couple of them here. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. 38 years and more. How's it been? Perfect every day? It's been better than manna and water. Yeah, it's doing something for 38 years is a long time. It's a long time, and over the course of that time, you're going to think and do a whole lot of other stuff. In fact, sometimes it might feel like everything is the same. Something might feel like it's getting kind of boring. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, we're reminded, here's the kind of the refreshment, the reminder of this. The Lord said, now get up and cross the Zared Valley. So we all crossed the valley. 38 years passed from the time we left Kadesh until we crossed the Zareb Valley. By then, this is a reminder, that entire generation of fighting men had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. The entire generation of people who saw the promised land the first time had to die before there could be another chance. In the meantime, during that 38 years, this is the truth. Is this still a truth today? We can get used to anything. That is a key, uh, you know, identity of humanity. We can acclimate ourselves to just about anything in this world, to horrible things, to great things. We will acclimate. The question is, what are we acclimating to? What are we getting used to? And this is where the boredom thing comes in, because when you're bored, it can be a really great thing. You can spur your creativity, you can do this, but when you're bored for a long period of time, what do we tend to do? We tend to kind of just do what's easiest, and whatever is easiest is not necessarily always good for us, is it? We can, when we're bored, get used to things that are not good for us. Has this happened to you over the last 18 months? Have you gotten used to things in your world, in your life, that maybe aren't the best for you? I bet we could all name at least one habit we wish we wouldn't have picked up during this time. Or one habit that we've dropped or forgotten about. Or one way to look at the world that we just can't go back to. I know many, many people during this pandemic time who have gotten much angrier than they used to be, much angrier. This goes to this category. We can get used to being anything, being anyone, acting in any way, but is it good? Is it good? Here's what happened to the Israelites during this 38 years. This is fascinating. So during these years, people grew, right? So young men who maybe were part of the spy group when they went into the promised land, they got older and older. And what happens to young men as they grow older? They kind of, eventually, they want to be in charge, right? It happens to everybody. As you get older, you kind of want to have more influence over the things that are going on around you. You want to have more say in things, absolutely. And this is exactly what happened. There was a time of very serious rebellion, where these two men, Dathan and Ibram and Korah, all kind of led the people into a rebellion against Moses. And this, this, this episode is, is really fascinating. Because remember, how does a rebellion start? It doesn't start just on one day. Somebody doesn't declare it's a rebellion. It's somebody has a great idea about what could be different and changed and better, and they talk to their friends, right? And their friends talk to their friends. 
And those friends talk to their friends, and it all seems kind of good and right, and then everybody gets excited about it. Does this sound like anything that you're maybe used to? This is how ideas spread. This is how we do things. This is the power of social media today, especially, right? Look at what happened. Moses summoned Dathan and Abram. This is after Korah told him, Korah tells Moses, um, we don't want to follow you anymore. We don't want to follow you anymore. You're, you're not in charge. We are now going to be in charge. Well, because Moses was, frankly, very, very old. <laughs> he was very old. It was time for change. So Moses summons these other two to him to talk. They say to him, we will not come. We will not come. Isn't it enough that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? Think about that for a second. Moses is the one who put his staff into the ground and the Red Sea split open. Do you want to make this guy your enemy? <laughs> he was the one who, when the whole community is thirsty, put his staff in a rock and water flowed from it. He's the one who, when there was a plague in the community, asked God and interceded for them, and the plague went away. He's the one who went up on Mount Sinai to broker a deal between God and this community. He was the one that God himself came to them and said, look, I am going to talk through Moses to you. And yet these guys say, who are you to boss us around? Isn't it enough that you, Moses, have brought us out of a land flowing with milk and honey? What was that land? What was that? Where did they come from? Egypt. Was there milk and honey there? Yes. Did they get any? No. Why? Because they were enslaved. They were enslaved. And yet, this is the story that is being told by the leaders and which is being believed by the whole community. You have brought us to kill us in this wilderness. Wait a second, wait a second. Why were the people marching around in the wilderness during this time period? What, what, remind me again. Whose fault was it? It was theirs. It was their fault. That is the truth, but that is not the story being told. And now you also want to lord it over us. Moreover, you haven't brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey. Seriously? You haven't brought us into it or given us the inheritance of fields and vineyards. Do you want to treat these men like slaves? Do you see how everything that God has said to his people has now been twisted around to use against him. When God came to his people on Mount Sinai, he said to them, I am the God who has brought you out of slavery into freedom. I am the God who has given you a land of promise that will flow with milk and honey that will be for you and all of your descendants, through which you will be a light to the world. I am the God who is going to come to you and give you a relationship with me, free, because I love you. Those are God's words to his people. And now they, because they have been bored, because they are uncomfortable, because they have a hard time dealing with the problems that they have caused themselves, have twisted these around and are now blaming God for the exact situation that they are in. People have not changed throughout the centuries. The temptations that we feel, the ways that we are, they don't change. We just have different clothes, different sensibilities, different technologies. Now, if you're like me, you must be thinking, nobody followed these crazy people right? Because Moses is Moses. Nobody's going to go against him. Well, what we find out is that all of the people followed these guys. All of them. 
In fact, it was so pervasive that Moses had to put them to a challenge. He had to say, fine, if you believe that God is not with me anymore and that he is with you, let's test the Lord. And so they tested the Lord. And in the morning after the test, these men and their families did not exist anymore. It's the first recorded act of a sinkhole actually happening in the Bible. Uh, What happened was the men who rebelled against God were swallowed up in a giant sinkhole. Thankfully, the rest of the community wasn't because God's anger was so great that he threatened to swallow up the whole community. But guess who interceded for everyone? It was Moses again. Lord, have mercy on these people. They don't know what they're doing. And God relented and said, these are the people I love, but they need to follow me. They need to hear my voice. They need to listen to me. And so this difficult Old Testament God, who is the same God of the New, made his justice known at this time. And so when all of the people in the camp saw these sinkholes open up and the families of these three leaders being swallowed up, what do you think they did? What would you do? You would say, whoa, we made a big mistake. We followed the wrong person. Moses was the Lord's anointed. We need to follow Moses. That's what you would do, right? That's what I would do. And yet that is not what the people did. Instead, what they did was they railed back at Moses. They said, Moses, you have killed all of our friends. Moses, you have killed the people. You see, ideas are really, really powerful. Ideas that we reinforce with one another are even more powerful. Ideas that we as a community, as a people, share with one another and tell the stories of are really powerful. And that is why we need to tell the story of our God and who he is for us and what he has done for us. Because in that story, love wins. In that story, mercy is had. In that story, people are freed from slavery in Jesus. This was a difficult 38 years for them. But all of these people who would not follow, who chose not to follow all the time, they didn't get to see the promised land. It was up to their children, the next generation, to see it. What do we learn from this part of the Exodus? It matters who the leader is. This whole rebellion was started because people didn't want Moses to be the leader anymore. Wait wait a second, wait a second. Was Moses actually the leader? Who was the leader? It was God, right? Moses had no power in and of himself. Moses, we think, probably even had a speech impediment. Like, he couldn't even speak well in front of people. He was not, you know, this charismatic leader. He was just a guy who God chose to be his spokesperson. The leader was the Lord. This happens later on when the people of Israel want a king, They say, Lord, give us a king. And God says, wait a second. I've always been your king. Why do you want a king? They're like, no, we want one that we can put on a throne, one that we can see and touch and give an iron scepter to. And God says, what are you guys doing? Why this again? Who is your leader? Who do you follow? There's only one good answer to this. Normal changes. Absolutely. In every circumstance, in every era, and every time, whatever is deemed normal is going to change. The question is, is it good? Does it adhere to this? Is it still going in the same direction, with the same hope, with the same promise at the end? Things can be different from generation to generation, right? Um, I just saw so many people's like homecoming pictures on Facebook, right? A lot of fun, but it brought me back to my own because now all the fashions have changed and I feel very old. All the fashions are now at the same point where I was the same age of all those students. Same clothes, I wish I would have kept them all, right? They'd be worth a fortune right now. Everything changes, normal changes. Is it good? That is the question when it comes to ideas and things that we hold so deeply. 
So I'm going to ask this again. What has become boring to you? What have you acclimated to in your life that may not be good? What ideas, what leaders have you let come into your life during this time of extraordinary change that may not be good for you? What have you followed that isn't of God? This is a hard question to answer. But it reminds us that we don't have to be stuck there. God does not leave us at that moment. His promise to us is a promise that endures, that, that is here for the long run. This is a quote from Eugene Peterson, who recently passed away, was an incredible writer and pastor, and somebody who just had a great sense of the weight of God's story upon us. And here's what he says. There is a great market these days for religious experiences, but there is little enthusiasm for the patient acquisition of virtue. Did you hear that? The patient acquisition of virtue. How do you become wise? Can a seven-year-old be wise? No, they can be smart, precocious. They can't be wise. It takes a long time to gather that. And even as you get up in years, you still may not have it. Wisdom is gained over time. There's little inclination to sign up for a long apprenticeship in what earlier generations of Christians called holiness. The good news for you today is that God establishes a relationship with you in an instant. At the moment of your baptism, when the Spirit comes to you, he says, you are mine. And that connection with him is instantaneous, and it lasts forever. But the life that we lead in between calls for this, calls for patient acquisition of virtue. It calls for a long apprenticeship. This is what we call living the Christian life. This is what we call discipleship. When we know who our leader is and follow that leader alone, for the rest of our lives, we get to learn from him. Right? When Jesus is walking with his disciples, uh, put yourself back in those days. There's sandals on. The roads are all made of dirt. As he's walking with his disciples, they are walking so closely to him that when he's walking, he kicks up dirt with his sandals. Guess where that dirt goes? It goes all over them. And they felt that the dirtier that they were with that dirt, the closer they were to God, literally. Do you want to follow Jesus in such a way? That with him as your leader, that you are so close that you are just picking up on everything that he is teaching. All the ways that this world is teaching you to share his grace and hope and peace with others. Are you that close? Or have you decided to follow a leader who's running out ahead? Who thinks that they know better or best? Or that they don't need that Jesus leader person anymore? Are you full of their dirt? and dust on you. Endurance is the flip side of boredom. Endurance is following this quote and this idea from Eugene Peterson, being patient, enduring a long, lifelong apprenticeship, learning how to share who Jesus is with those around you. This is what he called his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And I think that idea puts into great words the opposite of what the Israelites in the Exodus were doing. They sure were not going in the same direction all the time, round and around and around. Their obedience lasted as long as they had food in their stomachs. But for us today, following Jesus means taking a whole life approach. It means following him through the great times and through the difficult ones. It means enduring with hope and with a clear sense of your mission in the middle of it. As we stay close to Jesus, we know that he calls us to change this world for good. It's only through his kindness that we show kindness to others. It's only through his mercy that we show mercy to others. Because on our own, we just will follow other things. We'll do other stuff because we get bored. 
All right, one last thing. Paul's remarks to us, a reminder. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, cover yourself in those. Right? Make this the dust that covers you. Because through that, people will see Jesus. Paul didn't have much time left after he wrote this letter. He probably wasn't going to see the Philippians again. And he loved them greatly and dearly. He could have written anything to them to remind them who they were in God's eyes and what they were called to do. And this is what he said. So take this to heart today. As you struggle with getting used to things, getting used to a new normal, you struggle with boredom and just the unending change that we have, remember to endure in who Jesus has made you to be. Remember to have hope, to know that this passion and this promise that God has given to you will not go away. It will last. But it's going to take a while to get there. It's going to be hard. But that's okay. God will be with you.